Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. I'm your host, Deacon Jonathan Stewart, and an amazing show for you today, something that I am passionate about with a guest that I am passionate about. It's Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, who's going to be talking to us about some of the connections between Gnosticism, the occult, and psychoanalysis. Hello, Dr. Sinclair. Hello, thank you for having me. Uh, it's, it's, it's a real real pleasure, real honor. I, I, I'm a big fan of your work, uh, and uh, I'm really, for all those who, who don't know your work, I'm really excited to be introducing it to them. And of course, uh, chances are if people, if, if you are interested in occultism, if you are interested in the human condition, you're out there on the high seas of the internet, you might have already encountered uh, Dr. Sinclair and her awesome podcast, her books, her website, and everything else. But uh, uh, Dr. Sinclair, before we get into the goods, I do have to pay my dues to Mammon. I have to uh, praise the Demiurge by <laughs> asking for people's money. Uh, we can't do the show without uh, your financial support. You can donate for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. You can put a cap on that if we do a lot of media. Over at Patreon.com, you get a few perks like uh, early access to episodes, some early access to some streaming ideas and Discord stuff where we're trying to experiment and try some more things. Honestly, we, we don't have a lot there because we don't want to lock up um, stuff behind a paywall. Uh, it makes us feel a little bit icky, uh, but we do want to give you something in return. Let us know if, if there's anything we can do for you. You can do one-time donations at paypal.com slash Gnostic. And if you can't help us out financially, we know these are difficult times. Uh, please tell people th about the show, share the show, like and rate us, subscribe, send your favorite episode, which will probably be this one, to someone in your life. Okay, uh, that's all behind us. Dr. Sinclair, uh, tell us about yourself, your work, and your interest in the esoteric. Ooh, that's a lot. Um, well, my name is Dr. Vanessa Sinclair. I'm a clinical psychologist. I have a PsyD, as we were just talking about before the show started, um, which means I have a doctorate in psychology. And my training clearly was not in the esoteric realm. It was very like standard medical psychology, you know, trained to work in hospitals, um, learning CBT and behavioral therapy and relaxation exercises. And I actually did a lot of my training, like actually in hospitals doing something called consultation liaison, which is when, you know, people are in the regular uh, medical side of the hospital, not the psychiatric area. Um, and if a doctor, their medical doctor notices that they seem to be having more of a difficult time than usual when people are in the hospital with like anxiety and depression and that sort of thing, then they call the psychologist to come in and kind of sit by people's bedside and just talk to them. So basically while you're in the hospital for say a week or two weeks or however long your stay is, you know, one of us from the psych team would come by and sit and talk to you and just see how you're doing and give you support. And, you know, a lot of people don't get a lot of visitors when they're in the hospital, sadly. So it's a really good service. And that was kind of my training. And I also work with people with brain injuries and people having like um, kidney transplants and heart transplants. Uh, so it was very medical training. And then after school, um, what I really wanted when I went to school for psychology was to learn like the Freudian psychoanalysis, private practice, you know, sitting behind the couch while someone lays down and tells me about their dreams and fantasies and creative life. Um, and that's not what school was so much. So I had to seek that out after school um, and do psychoanalytic training post doctorate. Um, and then the esoteric got woven in basically once I kind of completed my training in that um, and I did all the things I needed to do uh, and to be a good citizen. Um, I had my psych psychology license and I was working in hospitals again. I was working at an HIV clinic, um, but I really wanted to kind of do something more creative because it was really depressing actually working in hospitals all the time. Um, and I felt like even though I really loved the work and loved the patients and loved you know, working with people one-on-one, -on -one, you know, the hospital system itself, the medical care system in, in the United States is so difficult to work with. And it's like, how am I supposed to help people feel better psychologically when they don't have a place to live? You know, things like that. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of frustrating. Um, and so I finally left the, the, the hospital system altogether and just went into private practice. And then I kind of realized I could start doing conferences um, just because everybody goes through New York at some point. So like you just start meeting a lot of people when you live there. Um, and, and we met a bunch of different great analysts and um, I started doing conferences and I did one on systemic violence 
basically talking about like the difficulties in the medical care system in the United States in 2015. And then that was really, really heavy um, studying that for a year and reading all about it and uh, talking about it. So after that, I was like, I need to do something fun. <laughs> so I decided to do a conference on psychoanalysis and the occult. And I threw the arts in there as well because everything's more palatable when people think about it as art. You know, <laughs> they're like, oh, that that artist is a magician, but they're, they're an artist, it's okay. And it's okay if you're an artist to do these things. Like, artists have kind of like a little leeway space in contemporary society. Um, so I decided to do these conferences on psychoanalysis and art of the occult. And um, one of the people at that conference on violence, one of the speakers was the psychoanalyst from London named Danny Nobis. And we were all at dinner afterwards, you know, like the last day of the conference. And Danny was like, what are you going to do next? And I told him, oh, I want to do something on psychoanalysis and the occult. And he's like, he had just become the chair of the Freud Museum in London. So he was like, oh, you should do it at the Freud Museum in London. And I was like, oh, wow, can I have a conference on the occult at the Freud Museum in London? That's amazing. Um, so that was really fun. And that's the thing that people don't realize. It's like, like you said, like you talk about Jung a lot on the podcast because Jung kind of got all of the occult and magical material after they, they kind of split. Like Freud and Jung had this famous split in 1914, whereas when they first met, um, in like 1906, um, they apparently the first time they met, they sat together for like 13 hours and just talked straight for 13 hours. And they just really had this like intense bond of relationship. And, you know, as is well known, Freud wanted Jung to kind of take the reins of psychoanalysis like after him and be his kind of, you know, son, the son of psychoanalysis, basically. There was a lot of pressure for Jung um, and Freud really, they both clearly had a lot of transference and, and feelings for one another. And then, of course, as they started realizing their relationship with any intense relationship, they had different ideas on things, they diff had different views. And the way Jung describes it in Memories, Dreams and Reflections, you know, Freud was getting to be really like rigid with how he wanted psychoanalysis to be presented. And Jung wanted to talk more about his ideas and his experiences with, you know, parapsychology and seances. And he wrote his dissertation about that. So it was already in his work. Um, and when they had this kind of famous split, all of that kind of went with Jung. And the Jungians since then always are the ones talking about it. And the Freudians, Lacanians, Kleinians, all the rest of the analysts kind of poo poo it or just like, put it to the side, just like Freud did as, as Jung's kind of spooky stuff. But what people don't realize is that even though Freud did that in public, in private, he actually did like these telepathy experiments all the time with his daughter and Sandra Ferenzi and other close colleagues. And he would have one Jung and Freud split. He actually like was so worried about what was gonna happen to the field of psychoanalysis that he got like his closest followers and he basically like gave them all rings and made them all like have this like secret group where they all wore these like magic rings and they met together and he talked about his experiments in telepathy with them, but he never talked about it publicly because he was really trying to, you know, the, the, that time in general was a time where people were trying to kind of separate science and spiritualism. And so he kind of went in that direction to kind of make the field legitimate. But the more time that passes, the more people are finding letters he's written to people and like papers that he wrote that were never published that um, that he talks about these things. Yes, and uh, I'm sure a lot of our uh, a lot of our listeners and viewers just going back to Jung and uh, Freud's relationship of being a father and son is probably setting off something there, and how 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 that was doomed to not go well. <laughs> um, no, that that is fascinating, and I'm really glad you're kind of exploding uh, you and others exploding some of these cliches and stereotypes about Freud and uh, and about uh, psychoanalysis and how some of this this interesting stuff could only be found in in the Jungians and actually. You know, I, I don't understand Lacan, um, but I like him. <laughs> um, I hope someday to do a whole show on, on Nazism and Lacan. But 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 to I, I'm wondering if you can for, for people out there not as familiar, if you can. And, and this is a huge question. I know, I know. Um, but can you tell us what is psychoanalysis? And you can can you kind of explain or 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 let us know? You know how how like a, a psychoanalyst would be going to see a psychoanalyst would be different to to go see a psychologist, right? Or how you know if you go take psychology courses at at university, what you're learning could be quite different than than psychoanalysis training. And I'll just share my own disappointment of, of being an undergrad, which was now a long time ago, just basically finding out, you know, Freud's not 
not taught in psychology departments and Marx isn't taught in economics departments, which is not <laughs> something I was expecting as a as, a, as an over eager uh, reader uh, in high school. But uh, but please uh, take it away, Dr. Sinclair. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Freud is not taught in psychology departments anymore. Rarely. It's very sad. And that's what I was surprised with when I went to get a doctorate <laughs> in psychology. I was like, where, where's Freud? There was no Freud. There was no Jung. I mean, there was, there were like these two professors that retired in Florida. I'm from Miami originally. And they had like retired in Florida and had basically had an office at the school. And in exchange for that, they like taught like one, ad, you know, extra class. Um, so I took like all the classes that they took as kind of extra classes, but that none of them were required or part of the regular curriculum. That was like for those people who wanted to still think about things in that way. Um, and it's, yeah, it's really been written off as this kind of archaic science and people think for he's misogynist and all of these things. Um, but it's really different in the way that, I guess the way I see it as being different is that it kind of puts the agency in the hands of the person coming in which in psychoanalysis is called the analysand instead of the patient or the client. Um, it kind of puts the, the, the treatment in their hands instead of in the hands of the you know, authority figure or therapist or analyst in the way that you know, if you're learning CBT and you know, CBT and behavior, behavior therapies and relaxation exercises, you know, learning how to reframe your thinking if you're going into kind of a spiral of despair or about to have a panic attack, learning to do breathing exercises, all of those things are very useful tools to have. And I think of them as uh, stress management tools. And I honestly think those kind of stress management tools should be taught to everyone in like junior high or high school <laughs> um, because everyone should just basically learn them because uh, they can really help. But, you know, you don't need to go to therapy forever to learn that. Like once you kind of learn those schools, skills and learn how to do that, you can kind of learn to do it yourself on your own. So I think those are great tools. But psychoanalysis is more um, hands off in the way that, you know, the analyst doesn't have any agenda of like what we're going to work on today. When you're becoming a psychologist, they teach you like, make sure you have a treatment plan, make sure you set goals with people. You know, it's very like hands on and it's very ego based in the way that it's like your conscious mind or your conscious self is the one deciding like what, what, what you're going to do and how the treatment's going to go and like what you want out of the treatment and what you want to change in your life. But the thing that psychoanalysis understands is that like our conscious mind or our ego that we identify with and think of as I, you know, who I think of Vanessa as, um, that's only one very small part of ourselves. And we actually like have this whole unconscious mind that has all sorts of things going on all the time. And we can see it during our days, you know, in, in psychoanalysis, I don't think when you say traditional psychoanalysis, like Freud saw his patients like six days a week. Um, and then now they say like the really traditional schools that teach it say you have to go four days a week. I don't think the, the time or the frequency really matters. It's more about the process that kind of gets going in the person. And of course, if you meet more often, then that process is going to be like more intense and you're going to get into it faster and deeper because you're just doing it more often. It's like if you work out every day, you're, you're going to see more results than if you work out once a week, you know, like it's, it just makes common sense. <laughs> um, but I think that like if you meet, say, twice a week, or, or if you are doing a traditional analysis and meeting every, every day, like four times a week, what you end up seeing is like, you think, what, what am I going to talk about every day, you know, for four or five days a week? But what you end up seeing is how much goes on in your mind during the day that normally we just don't pay attention to. Like we just write it off. We just ignore it. But when you start talking about yourself and, and what's going on in your mind, every day for an hour, you start seeing, wow, there's a lot coming up. Like anytime you look at a certain thing or hear a certain word, like a certain memory will come up or a word reminds you of something else or someone else, or you have fantasies or daydreams or dreams at night. Uh, a lot of times people start dreaming more at night or recalling their dreams more. So it's more focused on that. And instead of having like a conscious, cognitive, intellectualized agenda of what you want to uh, what you want to get out of your treatment, it's more like just looking at your mind and being like, what's going on in there? And like, why is that person popping up today? Or what does this remind me of? Or why am I thinking about this memory from childhood? And just looking at it like with a sense of curiosity and exploration, it's kind of just like exploring yourself. And you don't really know what's going to happen or where it's going to go. You just kind of go with the process. And that's the free associative process. And people often comment when they start analysis how different it is than our normal day-to-day -day way of being. 
um, because people aren't used to doing that. We're used to like having a plan or trying to achieve a certain goal. But I feel like our, our real goals, like the things that we really want and our lives become richer when we stop doing that so much and just kind of like go with the flow a bit more. And I think that's where it ties in with magic a lot too. And also artistic creative practices. It's like once you kind of get into the rhythm of that kind of creative practice or magical practice or psychoanalytic space, you see like things will manifest maybe in a way that you would have wanted them to that you hadn't even thought of consciously but it's like some other part of you is willing that and that's also like with the will and like willing things in magic like you're not all when you're a magical practitioner you realize you know there's a lot of people people when they're starting also with magic they get really worried about like what if i will the wrong thing or what if i get the thing i don't really want or what if i don't like phrase it exactly correctly and then something bad happens <laughs> and it's like stop worrying so much <laughs> and just kind of like learn through the process what you want with yourself and like the more you get comfortable with the process the more you see that you're manifesting things you want that you might not have even imagined consciously yeah yeah, and uh, obviously we're, we're we're going to come back to that in a moment. But before we kind of draw dive into some of these uh, the possible connections with the occult, can you talk about what what you see as some of the big misconceptions that are out there around psychoanalysis? Oh well, they're well founded <laughs> um, <laughs> because I think psychoanalysis sadly went in a really. Um, and psychoanalytic direction, I will say, uh, especially after World War II when it came to the United States, because basically, you know, Freud, Freud was starting the field early on, like, you know, right before the turn of the century, uh, 1900. The inter Interpretation of Dreams was published in 1900, but it is actually published in 1899, but he um, wanted it dated 1900, so it would be like of the new century. Um, and that was like his first huge book, Interpretation of Dreams. And it's a really great book. If you just read chapter seven, you don't really need to read the rest of it so much. Just read chapter seven. It's great. Um, but like after World War One, when he saw how devastating, how devastated everything was in Europe, he went from moving from this this view that he had had like like what I'm talking about with the split with Jung and like trying to make it a science. He still did that, but he really expanded his view and stopped being so worried about how it would be seen after World War One, and basically just realized that he really wanted to help as many people as possible. And there was actually this period between the two wars where um, a lot of the psychoanalysts of that generation actually set up these like free clinics where they were treating like as many people as possible with psychoanalysis because he really felt it would help with the trauma of the war and that sort of thing. And he really wanted to do this like service for everyone. But then of course, when World War II came, you know, most psychoanalysts were Jewish and a lot of psychoanalysts were murdered um, or committed suicide to avoid being murdered. A lot of the major theorists and then the ones who weren't killed at that time, but basically the, the Nazis and the Soviets, both of them did not like psychoanalysis. So no matter where people went, you know, they, they were per persecuted. And the people that fled and came to the United States, um, of course, uh, wanted to protect themselves. And what, they ended, what ended up happening when psychoanalysis kind of came to America was that it basically started turning into more of this thing called ego psychology, which is exactly what I was talking about before. It became more aligned with our conscious ego. And um, instead of thinking so much about dreams and like the mystery of life, basically, it became more about like wanting to make your ego really strong and your defenses really strong so that you could keep going to work, so that you could have your nuclear family, so that you could be like basically a good capitalist <laughs> and a good like worker. And that was really not, you know, Freud did say like, you know, he wanted everyone to be able to love and work, but he didn't mean it in that capitalist work sort of way. He meant it as like finding what you're driven to do and like do your work, you know, even in the, with the capital w work, w work, we could think of it in that way. Um, and it really turned into this more kind of more psychological theory where it did blend more with psychology and was more concerned with just like making symptoms be reduced so that people could continue functioning in day-to-day -day life and in society, which is important as well, but it's not quite as romantic as like just exploring your mind and seeing what happens. Yeah. So I think a lot of misconceptions about it being that and becoming like elitist also, like 
oh, people can't afford it. it. It's too much time a week. People think it's maybe kind of narcissistic of people or indulgent to like lay down and think about themselves. Who can afford to do that? You know, the 1950s housewives is like the classic trope that don't really have anything else to do and their husbands pay for the treatment. And then the analyst tells the husband what they're talking about in their treatment. You know, all those things happen. Yeah. So I think that it gets a rap, bad rap in those ways for a reason. Um, but I think also it's not much different than like any other kind of mental health care. So it hasn't done anything worse. Um, but I think right now actually is a very exciting time for psychoanalysis because um, it is more flexible. And I think a lot of people are tired of, of the medical model more and like being categorized. I mean, the, the DSM, the diagnostic manual um, where everyone gets diagnosed from with anxiety, depression, or parent disorder, or whatever they have, you know, it's got like, I don't know, 500 or 800 diagnoses in it now. It's like an insane amount of diagnoses. So it's like, definitely you can find every person in that book. So it's like, does every single person have a psychological disorder <laughs> or are we all human? I think it's really doing a disservice for the people who really are suffering. And of course we are all suffering in certain ways, but maybe that's because um, we're people and we're living in this society that's a little bit corrupted. <laughs> like maybe there's a reason that we're all having panic attacks and depression and anxiety because like this, the, this way of life is not that sustainable for a lot of people. Um, a lot of people are working really hard and not really reaping the rewards of their work um, and that sort of thing. You want to talk about Marx, you know? So, so um, yeah, so I think that, that right now it's a good time for psychoanalysis because it is thinking outside of the box in that way. And that's why you, you mentioned Lacan. And actually, if you want a Lacanian analyst who's also an occultist, I can send you a, an email of someone. You can have him on too. Uh, he also talks about Deleuze and Guattari and like schizoanalysis. So that could be kind of fun. Oh, um, amazing. Yeah, he's fun. Um, and yeah, so I think that Lacan really helped break us out. Like you don't have to think about Lacan's theory because it is really complicated. And most people are just like, what are these people talking about? But once you learn what the jargon words mean, then it's not as complicated as it's made out to be sometimes. Sometimes it still is. But what he really did, which was really good for psychoanalysis, was kind of confront the analytic institutes. And he had what he called the return to Freud, where he said, you know, we've gotten way off track here. And the psychoanalysis of his day, say it's the 1950s and 60s, he's like, the psychoanalysis that we see today is nothing like what Freud was doing or what he had envisioned, like with his free clinics. You know, it had turned into this very elitist thing that was very like structured and you have to go through so many years of training and it, it's so expensive and it just became really uh, prohibitive and, and, and it wasn't flourishing anymore. And he said, we need to get rid of all of this and stop, you know, why do you need a decade of training to be an analyst? You know, let's get rid of this and like break it down and like train more people and train artists again. Freud was into what's, what's called lay analysis. He didn't think you had to be specifically a medical doctor to be able to be a psychoanalyst. You could be a psychologist, you could be a social worker, you could be an artist. You, a lot of psychoanalysts now are people that have PhDs in literature or film, especially in other countries, not in the United States so much, but in Europe and South America. And that's because that's where psychoanalysis has really continued to be taught. It's not in psychology anymore. It's in the literature departments, it's in the film departments, it's in the arts. You know, um, so Lacan kind of made that start happening and also um, kind of brought us back to Freud's original ideas and out of this whole like ego psychology um, debate where people were just been debating like terms and, you know, disorders and like they just gotten really off track, he felt. And I agree. And I'm really glad that he did that because I think it's really helped the field flourish again. Yeah. So, uh, so we touched on this, but uh, uh, we can go uh, quite deep, and I know there's actually quite a lot to talk about here. But, but why should uh, or why would an occultist, a Gnostic, an esotericist, a magician, whatever, be interested in psychoanalysis? Um, I think what R Israel Regarity said was really great. Um, he said that everyone should be in some sort of psychoanalytic treatment for a year before they really start their magical practice. And I don't know if you have to do it before, you can do it at the same time or anytime really. But I think that was a really good idea. And I think it was basically because it helps you look at yourself and kind of learn more about yourself. And uh, like I said before, like people often think, you know, of magic as like, 
implementing your will, right, with capital W, but like then not knowing or not realizing that what you consciously want may not be what you really want, like with your whole self and the unconscious. And if you want to talk about Jung, the collective unconscious, like what's best for the collective, what's best for all of me, not just what my ego wants, which might be something narrow or greedy or, you know, mis misadvised. Um, and I think uh, going through some sort of analytic treatment for a year or however long you want to can kind of help your conscious mind learn more what the rest of you is doing and up to and thinking so that your conscious and your unconscious um, become more aligned. Because a lot of people, when they're having symptoms, whether it's, say it's a panic attack, for example, it's because like your unconscious mind is trying to get you to pay attention to something. Maybe it's an old trauma. Maybe it's you know, an old memory, maybe it's just something you haven't been paying attention to. Um, and a lot of times, I'm sure a lot of people have noticed people tend to repeat like relationship patterns. So it can help you figure out like, how do I keep ending up in the same relationship over and over? Like this person seems different, but it's the exact same thing I just loved. And they just keep doing that. And it helps you to figure out like, why are you? Like what, usually when we're repeating something like that, it's because there's something unresolved or there's some sort of trauma that we're trying to correct. And our unconscious wants to like think, well, if we do it over, we can get it right this time and not, not have it turn out badly like it did before. But that usually never happens. It usually just ends up turning out the same way every time. And you can usually find that, uh, find, figure out that that actually maybe the relationship you've kept having was really similar to your parents' relationship with one another or to your relationship with one of your parents. And it's something you've been trying to work through and resolve and like make right, but it's not going to happen. It's just, it's just going to keep you in this cycle and get you stuck. And I always think of like, if you can figure out those patterns and figure out what you're trying to address or what you need to address, you can kind of, it takes a lot of energy to kind of keep your unconscious tied up in those kinds of things, those patterns. And if you can address them and really work through them, then you can release that energy and that just gives you more energy for your magic, for your creativity, for your potential. So you can invent your life in a way that you want it to be more rather than just rehashing out these kind of old patterns that maybe even ancestral patterns, you know, people are learning a lot more now about transgenerational transmission of trauma and how people, which of course, like indigenous cultures and other cultures have known about forever. Um, but, you know, people might be enacting something that could be a trauma from great grandparents or further back even. So like uh, releasing all of that can really give you more energy to create what you want in your life and manifest more what you want in your life rather than that be kind of being tied up in these old old patterns. Right, right, exactly. And and I'm sure any of the, particularly the Gnostics out there, but uh, any of the esoterics and mystics are probably screaming at the screen, you know, uh, 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 the two words, three words, uh, know thyself, right? And this seems, you know, that is that is the imperative. That is the, that is what is pushed upon you if you go down this path uh, uh, when dealing uh, with esoteric spirituality. And this seems like filling that maxim. Um, the other thing too, uh, oh gee, uh, I had a thread that I, I wanted to, oh, uh, even just the ego, right? Which, which is a word that I believe uh, Chagam Trungpa, the Buddhist, uh, might have been one of the first to, to, to use in, in a sort of uh, meditative mystical sense, grabbing it from Freud, I believe. But uh, again, any of the mystics out there, the meditators are like, well, you, you know, I, I think a lot about this ego thing and <laughs> I really want to uh, uh, explore it and perhaps in, in some ways move past it, which is what uh, uh, some mystics uh, uh, seem to do. So it, it, the connections do seem quite strong to me. Um, I, I had a question, just I was talking to a friend uh, about, about Freud and libido. Before we move on, is 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 like where is will in Freud? Is is libido will? Yeah, that's a great question, and I think that libido is like you can think of it as like the driving for force, like your drive, um, and that could be aligned with your like true will rather than your like. Um, conscious will of like, oh, I want this car or whatever. <laughs> um, so yeah, you could think of it that way, like your true drive. Um, and, and you know, Jung said that as well. So like the, the libido is also like the sexual, but it's also the creative part of us. It's whatever helps us, yeah, like manifest, create things in the world. It's like a really, our driving force. Yeah. 
Um, well, this leads uh, quite well into my next question. Another big one, but they're always big ones on on this show uh, as we uh, plumb the, the yeah exactly <laughs> plumb the mysteries of the universe. But do you see any more ideas or concepts in the many analytic schools? Because of course, psychoanal uh, and. Uh, uh, psychoanalysis uh, is not one thing, but within the schools and bodies of thought that, that really seem similar or have strong resonances with ideas that you've encountered in occultism? That's a good question too. Um, as far as other schools, I mean, the people I read and study the most, and I'm kind of trying to integrate their theories um, are like Freud, Lacan, and Jung. Um, I think pulling from the best of all of them really works well for me in my practice. And I've read a lot of other analysts. I mean, like there, there's a school of thought um, that I don't so much practice, but that's really popular now in the United States called relational psychoanalysis. And that actually stems from this early colleague of Freud, Sandor Ferenczi, who's Hungarian. Um, and Freud only came to the United States one time in 1909, and he came with Jung and Sandor Ferenczi. So they were all very close. And um, Sandor Ferenczi is also the person that Freud did these thought experiments with, these telepathy experiments with, along with his daughter, Anna Freud, the most. Like that's who he was the closest with in that way. And the relational school is kind of stemmed from his work. And they believe that like, uh, psychoanalysis isn't just about the individual, like, like Lacan is very much like it's all about the analysis and that the, the an analyst's ego or person shouldn't come into the treatment like at all. Um, but Sandor Ferenzi and, and the relational analyst, they talk more about the two people being in the room and they talk more about like this idea I really love um, that doesn't even much matter what's said because it's like the two unconsciouses just uh, kind of being in the room together are having a sort of communication that the mm -hmm. actual words being said are kind of obsolete or the, like, the least important part. What's more important is like all this unconscious communication that's happening that the, that the two people in the room aren't even consciously aware of. I think that's a really interesting idea. And they also talk about how the two people kind of create this um, third mind of a sort and that this like their two minds coming together um, helps bo both of them. It changes both of them, actually. They don't think it just changes the analysis, but that the analyst is also changed by the patient, which I think is also true. I think I learned so much from the people that I've seen throughout my career. Um, and I think analysts do need to recognize that more. It's not in the same way. And the, the analysis and the patient is not aware of how they might be affecting you. And you shouldn't tell them, I don't think. I think the relation analysts do, and I don't think that you should do that. I think that in, in the room, it should be all about just the person coming in for treatment um, because, you know, pe people get enough advice <laughs> from other people in their lives. I think it's really important that analysts refrain from giving advice, refrain from thinking they know what's best for the person and just like let the person figure it out because there's not really many spaces we get to do that. Um, so in that way, I, I don't think that that would be a good practice to actually tell them how they're affecting you. But I think that it is true that, you know, people just encountering different people brings up different parts of yourself and makes you think about different things in your life that they might not realize. Um, but other than that, I don't really know specifically any magical concepts I can think of um, outside of Jung and Freud and Lacan. Lacan, I, I like I like the cut. Lacan's all about scansion, mm -hmm. um, which the Lacanians, the proper Lacanians, actually, they actually cut sessions early. So instead of it being like a full 45 minutes or 50 minutes, they just stop the session whenever they feel like you've had an aha moment um, and that you should just like stop and think think about that the rest of the day. Like, okay, that was an amazing point you just made. Leave the room and go think about that. And they think that the analysis continues on like in between sessions. And I think that's very true. Um, but I can't cut people off in session. I just like can't do it. So I, I let people have their 45 or 50 minutes. And I do try to end the session in a way instead of saying like, bye, thank you, see you for the day. I do try to instead and it, when they've said something around the 45 or 50 minute mark, that is something like, oh, that would be a good thing to leave on or, or think about going out of the room. I try to end it there instead of with like usual pleasantries just to keep the analytic process more in the front of the person's mind. Because sometimes when you do those pleasantries, that can kind of go back away. Um, but I think you can mark those moments in a session without actually kick kicking someone out of the room. You can just say like, you repeat the point they just made, be like, you know, you just said, oh, this person said this, and you could just say that exact same 
thing right back to them and it'll make them think about it in the room. They don't have to, they don't have to be kicked out. Um, but I think that idea of, of cutting and like, it's a different kind of magic, but like the magic that William Burroughs did with the cut up method, you know, I love that. And I think that um, those kinds of disruptions can also have a lot of magical effects and can also break us out of these like routines and ways of thinking that can then end up being like much more generative and creative for us if we start thinking about things in different ways. So to me, that's also magical. Yeah, you, you know, I I, I uh, 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 sort of uh, praising your work at the top of the show, but but I forgot to to mention um, a personal impact that you've had on me, which is uh, the my my day job is I, I'm a writer, right? With marketing, uh, copywriting, uh, not always the most exciting things. But if you're out there and want to hire me, please. <laughs> um, but I'm trying to get more in creative writing, and I, I've always liked. Um, methods that that engage the unconscious i'm a big boros fan but your your love and hype around the cut up method kind of got me re-inspired about it i'm like oh man yeah that's right this rule so so thank you so much for it and i i've had some sort of creative explorations in my more creative work using it so um so yeah we'll we'll have to uh, you'll have to send me some links about some of your writing uh, um uh and and some of your explorations of the cut up method and we'll we'll uh link those up for people out there because i know there's a lot of artists a lot of writers out there and uh you definitely uh want to want to try it but uh moving on um okay so we usually do plugs at the end but perhaps we could do one right now uh and if you could tell us you have a bit of an upcoming you have an upcoming talk on freud and the occult right so uh, obviously we don't want you to do the whole talk right now or people won't sign up for it but i was wondering if you could tell us about that talk and maybe talk a, a little bit give us a little teaser or taste of of how freud was inspired by some esoteric ideas sure um yeah i was thinking about too i was like what do i tell you that doesn't give away the whole talk <laughs> it just has to be a teaser um, but yeah, I started these conferences, like I said, on psychoanalysis and the occult and, and the arts uh, back in 2016. And actually, the very first talk that I gave on it was about cut ups with my third mind partner, Caitlin Foisy, at the Morbid Anatomy Museum. So everything's <laughs> come full circle and like enmeshed with each other. Um, and that was in January of 2016. Um, and so now we're back at Morbid Anatomy again. So Carl, Carl Abrahamson and, and I, my, my now husband, he wasn't when we planned the conference in London in 2016, but he became my romantic partner at the conference in London in 2016. And then we got married. Um, we had this London conference then, and then we had another follow-up conference called Rewriting the Future um, in 2019 in Italy. And now we're having our third kind of series of events of that, in that way. At Morbid Anatomy again, uh, and this will be all online, and it's Sundays in September, so it's every Sunday at 2 p.m. Eastern, and the first one is this coming Sunday on the 5th, and I'm going to be talking about Freud and his explorations of the occult, as you mentioned, and then the other person speaking with me, I always like to pair people because I think it's more fun generating discussion at the end, uh, is this other analyst philosopher named Isabel Millar, who you will all love. Everybody loves her. She's hot, first of all. And second of all, she studies Lacan and artificial intelligence, specifically sex bots. Wow. So um, yeah, it's just fun. She's always great. And so she's going to be presenting as well on Sunday. And as far as explorations of the occult, like I said, I've with, with these conferences, I'm trying to kind of remend this split, this original split that Freud and Jung had, um, because I think it's really unfortunate. I mean, it's inevitable that that happens with really intense relationships like that, especially when someone thinks that you're their son, of course. Um, but I think that the split in the field is really unfortunate, and it's basically like everyone but the Jungians writes like anything esoteric off altogether. Um, and the Jungians are not part of academia like at all. I mean, we're talking about like like Freud and Lacan at least are in like philosophy departments and you know literature departments but like Jung is like nowhere to be found and I think that's really unfortunate but in another way I guess good for the Jungians because they just like do their own thing and who cares um, and they haven't worried too much about like working with insurance companies and <laughs> that sort of thing they've always been like creative at exploring the mind and never really got derailed so that's really great. But I'm trying to kind of remend that and bring esoteric thinking and, and Jungian psychology back with Freudian psychoanalysis um, and throwing Lacan in there as well. 
And I talk about a little bit about the history um, in the in the talk because I wrote it last weekend, so I know what I talk about. Um, I talk about before he started this group with the rings, and uh, I go over some of his papers. That there's a 1953 book by George Devereau called Psychoanalysis and the Occult, where this anthropologist slash psychoanalyst collected a bunch of papers that early analysts had written on occult topics like telepathy and dreams being like having premonitions in dreams and that sort of thing. Um, and so I, I used that book as a jumping off point and Freud actually contributed, I think, five papers to the book. And then I talk about different letters um, where you find more in, in information about that and, and how at the end of his life, he actually wrote to somebody that like if he had it to do all over again, he would focus more on the thought experiments um, because that's really, he, you know, by the end of his career, he really felt like telepathy was real and, and, and he couldn't say, of course, it's 100% for sure, but basically it's 100% for sure. <laughs> um, and no, nobody thinks that about Freud, you know, like nobody, that's not a thing in Freud when you think about Freud or Freud's thought, um, but that's what he came to. Uh, understand and you know I think that people in general especially psychologists and psychoanalysts it actually I, it actually is unbelievable to me how narrow-minded psychologists and psychoanalysts can be um, and and the mental health field and field in general because I really see mental health as like you know looking at the wonder of being a human on this magical planet and like what are we doing here <laughs> like you know what is this we're like in, in outer space on this like li alive marble where like there's all these crazy animals and like you know what like what in the world is this and then what do we do with it we like think we have to go to a nine to five job and like argue about you know, just stupid shit. <laughs> it's just like really a shame, honestly, like that this is what we're doing with, with our time here. But anyway, that's me going on a whole other rant. But I, I really I really get surprised on and how narrow minded people that work with the mind can be. And so I'm trying to kind of bring back some of that mystery and like thinking about dreams and fantasies and seeing how, you know, our world can be much bigger and we can manifest different things because we have created this world and we can manifest things in a, in a different way if we want to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I, I love that, you know, and that, that is, that is a rant I can get behind <laughs> Dr. Sinclair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and for those listening at home, the, the, you know, we're, we're going to have a lot of links in the show notes, but that's a morbidanatomy.org slash events. So uh, definitely don't miss out on that. Pivoting a little bit, but not too much, of course. Uh, Dr. Sinclair, do you see any connections between art, the creative act, and the occult? I do. I think I'm definitely of the mind that uh, art is magical or can be. It's the same thing that's happened in the art world, right? Like with art schools, a lot of them have gone very cognitive. And like, you know, the artists, like I've had, say, analysis that have been in art schools and they're told, like, you have to think about what you're trying to say. You know, what are you trying to say with this artwork and what message are you doing? And it's very political and um, you have to have an identity that you're like explaining or disrupting or something. And I think to me, the best art is art that's like really coming from the unconscious. Um, of course, you can have this kind of training as an artist, as a fine artist, if you want, and then working with that. But like, I think at the end of the day, the art that's more spontaneous and like Francis Bacon, I always think of and how he just like, you know, he clearly was a very skilled, fine artist and he could paint things perfectly and people perfectly if he wanted, but then he would like smear it and just like kind of let his emotions come out on the canvas and he was known to destroy a lot of his work. Uh, but I think that more unconscious, spontaneous art is definitely magical. And of course, also like the very early religions that we had, you know, it is kind of our first form of art and magic, like early religion, early art and magic is all the kind of same thing. Like creating these rituals, using fire, using dances, creating costumes, you know, that's all super magical and, and, and is all artwork now. And it's also so weird to me that people go to museums and look at these artifacts and they just think of them as these like kind of static, like art objects instead of like realizing that these are all like really magically charged um, pieces that are in these museums, like in these glass cases, it's very strange. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, Dr. Sinclair, a, a question I got inspired to, to, uh, to ask listening to you and uh, Stephen D. speak, um, uh, the hopefully, or future, future guest of the show. But if we're talking about magic and psychoanalysis, are we then forced into using the so-called, quote-unquote, psychological model, model of magic? I think a lot of people do do that, um, but I don't think you have to. And I think that um, I definitely went through, I mean, I've been through def different evolutions in my life. And, you know, I was much more magical when I was younger, which I think a lot of people experience as a child, as a teenager. And then of course you start getting like normalized in society and, oh, I'm a psychologist and I have to think these ways and do these things. And fortunately I was able to like re, re undo all of that, that normalization that I had kind of been put through and like bring back the magic. But I think unfortunately a lot of people don't. And there was definitely a period in there that um, I was thinking of things as more like everything's a projection of the mind and also thinking of like, you know, different gods that people have created, that sort of thing, all those like projections of ourselves um, and thinking of things that way. But then through some experiences, personal experiences and um, encountering different people at different religious practices, um, I've, de I've started realizing at, at a certain point, like that might be pretty narcissistic of people to just think that we invent all of this in our minds. Like, why wouldn't there be other entities or things around, you know, if we're here, why, why would we be the only sentient beings like in all of the universe? <laughs> that kind of seems also a bit odd. So I stopped doing that and started being more respectful and thinking of it more as like, working you know i don't i'm not so much into like worshiping anything um but i i think of it more as like having working relationships with other kinds of beings um and that it's like mutually beneficial like a, like a real friendship you know i i'm your friend i promote your podcast you promote mine everybody wins you know it's good so like we can work with each other and it benefits both of us so i started thinking of it more that way um, I think most psychologists, well, first of all, most psychologists don't believe in magic, <laughs> period. <laughs> and they think that um, if you uh, do do have magical thinking, for example, that's something that's a symptom in the DSM that you're you know going to have a psychotic disorder that's lifelong and you need to be treated for. So um, there's that. But then I think a lot of the psychologists that uh, are more magically minded do think of it more as a like pro projection, like psych psychology, and think of it in that way. Um, and maybe think of it as something that's interesting to study, but maybe not so real, things like that. But honestly, it's really hard to find, uh, sadly, psychologists that are open to uh, even people talking about their magical practices. And I'm trying to change that. Um, and create like networks, like if somebody does have a magical practice and they wanna be able to talk openly in their therapy or analysis, they should be able to and not be judged or you know treated differently because their, their religious or spiritual way of being isn't one of like the major monotheistic religions. Um, I think that people need to be able to speak about what they're doing, but it's unfortunately people are a lot of times really afraid to because they don't want to be pathologized or judged or or even locked away if people think they're getting too loony with it. Um, so I've tried to create like a network of other psychologists and analysts that I know that I know either are also magical practitioners so they're open to it or at least they're open-minded to it and aren't going to judge you and that way if somebody wants a referral I have that kind of referral network for them. Wonderful, amazing. Um, so uh, unfortunately, uh, time to wrap up, um, though I would love to uh, go forever, but you have a life. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Sinclair, a closing question. Uh, does desire desire its own repression? And if so, why? That's a good question. And this is a huge debate in psychoanalysis. Um, but I think, I don't think it, it does inherently, but I think the neurosis that a lot of us develop from living in the type of society that we live in um, does cause that, uh, does cause us to repress our desires and, and that it's come to a point where people kind of get off on it. It's like, oh, I, I desire this thing to happen, but I'm like sabotaging myself 
um, and repressing it. But then that kind of gives me another kind of satisfaction. Like people yes. are satisfied that they can't desire their desire. <laughs> um, so maybe we've kind of subverted it in that way that at least you're still getting a little bit of satisfaction in, <laughs> even when you do that to yourself. But I think, uh, I think it is, a, I think, I don't think it's something inherent in humans. Um, I think it's more, we, I think we see a lot of it, at least in the US, there's a lot of it. And I think it has to do with the kind of society that we live in and the, the way society think values us is like only being valuable as workers and only being valuable if we achieve a certain thing and, and not valuing the arts and definitely not valuing magic um, and de not valuing psychoanalysis either actually. So um, I think I've, I've also started realizing that I think a lot of these things that, that uh, typical Western society does not value like the arts and psychoanalysis and magical practices are is actually like very disempowering for individuals because all those practices to me really help people find their will find their passion find their agency and it's almost like the society's um, built itself in a way to kind of um, deter people from finding those things so that we keep continuing to be like wor little workers um, and not disrupting the system too much so i think doing those things having a magical practice Going in psychoanalysis, having a creative practice, disrupting things, uh, really gives people back their their own power and their sense of agency, and is really where things should be at. Well, talking about uh, the, a good place to end the session with an insight, I think <laughs> I think that's perfect, uh, Doctor Sinclair. Uh, you have many links. I'm going to put them all in the notes, uh, but we'll flash a couple up on the screen. And I'll say them out loud for those people who are uh, listening to the audio version. But if you if you want to see all the energy that can be unleashed through psychoanalysis, uh, Doctor <laughs> Sinclair and her partner are great examples uh, because of the many amazing projects they do. But uh, your homepage is drvanessasinclair.net. Is that right? And people can find the, the the many things that you do there. Links to everything there. Yeah. Yeah. And your podcast is renderingonconscious.org. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit about that uh, that podcast? Yeah. So in Rendering Unconscious, I interview mostly psychoanalysts, but also magical practitioners. And sometimes they're both like Steve D is a systemic psychotherapist and a Gnostic practitioner um, and chaos magician. Um, so I've been mixing them up. I have also have had like Kate Lefoise and Chiron Armand who do more like um, folk magic traditions. Um, so I, I mix it up with that. And then I have like psychoanalysts that are not at all magical <laughs> practitioners, but are really great uh, thinkers in the field and have them talk about their work. And I've also had like poets and artists talk about their creative process. So it's kind of all three of those things. Those are my kind of things that I love, psychoanalysis, art and magic. Um, and that's a good mix of them, but mostly psychoanalysts, mostly people that are really in the forefront of the field doing really innovative things. Yeah, and quickly again for the uh, for the people at home, uh, uh, Doctor Sinclair's uh, course here in September twenty twenty one. Who knows when you're listening or watching to this? Uh, MorbidAnatomy.org slash events, and uh, of course, uh, again we have to give our due to the Demiurge to Momin, which is Patreon.com slash Vanessa twenty three and Carl. Um, so sorry, that's Vanessa twenty three Carl, not Anne. Okay, <laughs> amazing. Thanks so much, Dr. Sinclair. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is Deacon Jonathan Stewart signing off. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.